Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh everyone and good morning. MashaAllah, uh, thank you all for taking time to seek knowledge and waking up on a, early on a weekend uh, to seek sacred knowledge. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam informed us that whoever goes out on a path seeking sacred knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates for them the path to paradise. And that this religion is uh, built upon knowledge. That without knowledge, we don't have guidance. And without guidance, we're not able to uh, be successful and truly live in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to. And that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us to live. So in order to accomplish that, we need sacred knowledge. So uh, these gatherings and this time that we spend together, inshallah ta'ala, is of the best time, uh, uh, the best way that we can spend our time in this life. Inshallah, in today's abridged uh, seminar, we're going to be looking at this really beautiful and profound book by Imam al-Ghazali from his Ihya Ulum al-Din the revival of the religious sciences. And this is book four of the 40 books that Imam al-Ghazali authored as part of this collection, the revival of the religious sciences. And in this book, he goes into an explanation and a description of the salah, of the prayer, uh, teaching us uh, and kind of giving us an overview in the book of the outward dimension of the salah as it relates to the validity of the salah and making sure that it's sound according to the outward uh, aspects and dimension. But he focuses primarily uh, and really gives us deeper insights into the meaning of the salah and the state that a person should have when praying. So inshallah in uh, today's seminar we'll have four sessions. Uh, to uh, beginning with this session, the merit of prayer. And then the next session, inshallah, with Sheikh Yahya Rodas, will be on the inner states of prayer. Imam al Ghazali tells us that we should have these internal states uh, within the salah in order for us to truly be experiencing and benefiting from the prayer. And then in session three, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to talk about reverence, khushur having this khushur and reverential awe and presence of heart in the salah. And then finally, with Shaykh Yahya in session four, uh, he will cover the inner meanings of prayer. And that's going to be, inshallah, very valuable. Imam al-Ghazali's, uh, his treatment of that, the, 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 the state of heart that we should have when we hear the adhan, when we're engaging in wudu, when we begin the prayer and all of the movements of the prayer in the Fatiha, all of the uh, inner meanings that should be present in our heart through all of those various aspects of the Salah. So inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq and we ask Allah that He blesses our time together and that He really allows each and every one of us to walk away with greater presence of heart and a deeper appreciation and realization of the salah, which is the, the pillar of this religion and the greatest means by which we draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, we'll begin with the first session, the merit uh, of the salah, and we'll look at the merit of the adhan. We'll look at the merit of the obligatory prayers and the congregational prayer and we'll look at the merit of prayer in the mosque. And then finally, the merit of sujood, of prostration in this session ta'ala, inshallah ta'ala. So Imam al-Ghazali, he begins his book with this really beautiful introduction. Beginning in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praise belongs to Allah who has immersed his servants in his gentleness and who cultivated their hearts with the lights of this religion and the rituals of worship, who has uh, in his generosity and mercy come down from the throne of majesty to the lowest heaven in order to make himself, uh, uh, to call out to his servants 
So he mentions here this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sallam that at the end of every night and the last third of every night, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He descends in His mercy and in giving people the opportunity to draw closer to Him and He calls out every night, هَلْ مِنْ دَاعٍ فَأَسْتَجِيبَ لَهُ Is there anyone making dua that I may answer them? وَهَلْ مِنْ مُسْتَغْفِرٍ فَأَغْفِرَ لَهُ Is there anyone seeking forgiveness so that I may forgive them? And that Imam al-Ghazali, he has this beautiful description. He says, look at how the kings of the world, you have to sometimes pay a bribe just to get an opportunity to meet with them. That there is all of this red tape. It is extremely difficult to be in the presence and have access to the kings of the world. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened the door and lifted the veil so that we can be close to him and call upon him and enter into his presence at any time. Tamam? So this is a really beautiful, Imam al-Ghazali has this way of uh, showing us the, the depth and the beauty of this opportunity. And this is one of the first things that we have to take into consideration when we're learning about the salah is that it's not a burden. We cannot look at the salah like it's a burden. Sometimes people say, oh, you have to get up very early. and It seems like a lot, praying five times a day. But in reality, it's the dunya that's quite heavy. It's the world that we want to always have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's support. And as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught us that when he would ask Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu to make the adhan, he would say, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Give us our comfort through the adhan. Bring what brings us comfort by calling uh, for the prayer. So here Imam al-Ghazali is saying that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and gentleness with us. So he has made the prayers a way that they can draw close to him and be in his presence, whether in congregation or whether a person is alone. And not only that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us that opportunity to be with him. And then he also, in his merciness, in his mercy and gentleness, he has actually made it, uh, uh, he has encouraged us and invited us. In addition, it's an obligation, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in addition to that, he has invited us in a very gentle way and has called us to be with him. So how exalted and glorified is he and how gentle and, and beneficent is he towards us subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he begins the book with that, that this is a great opportunity and a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he has a breakdown of the book because this is an abridged seminar. We're just going to focus on the topics uh, that I had mentioned, inshallah, and uh, maybe in, a, in another opportunity, we'll be able to go into more depth in the book, but inshallah, this will still be uh, very useful and beneficial. So the first chapter is on the merit of the various aspects of the prayer. The prayer itself, prostration, praying in congregation, the adhan, and so forth. So he starts off with the adhan. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, la yasma'u sawt al-mu'adhini jinnun wala insun wala shay'un illa shahida lahu yawm al-qiyamah. That anything, whether it is the jinn or any human being or anything, even inanimate objects in creation, whenever they hear someone call the adhan, they will testify and bear witness to that on the day of resurrection. So this is a really beautiful thing that whenever you call the adhan, the trees, the animals, other people, other jinn will testify on behalf of that individual and say, I heard this person call the adhan. So Imam al-Ghazali is telling us that the adhan will be a proof for us when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala says in the Noble Qur'an, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا Who is better in speech? In other words, there is none better in speech 
than the one who calls and invites to Allah and does righteous actions. That some of the scholars of tafsir regarding that verse, some say that it's in relation to da'wah, calling people and inviting people to Allah. Other mufassirin said, this is specifically in regards to the mu'adhin. Right? This is the one who invites to Allah, is the one who calls to the prayer. Right? So this is the one who calls people to the salah. That's one of the meanings of this ayah. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam also said, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمُ النِّدَاءِ فَقُولُ مِثْلَ مَا يَقُولُ الْمُؤَذِّنِ If you hear the call to prayer, then repeat what the mu'adhin says. This is a really beautiful and important sunnah, that when we hear the adhan, uh, we should uh, you know, bring to a conclusion any conversations or pause the conversation that we're having and listen to the adhan and respond. And when the mu'adhin says, you know, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, that we also say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And we'll talk about the inner meanings of that, what should come to our heart when we hear the adhan in session four. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And then when the mu'adhin says, Hayya ala salah, come to the prayer. Our response there should be la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no power or ability saved by Allah. Hayya ala al-falah, come to success. Once again we say la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. That there is no power or ability saved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after the mu'adhin is done, and we repeat all of the things that he says, we should say this dua, Allahumma rabba hadhihi al-da'wat al O oh Lord, O oh Allah, Lord of this comprehensive supplication, was-salati al-qa'imah, and this prayer that is about to be established. Aati Sayyidina Muhammadan al-wasilata wal-fadila. Give Sayyidina Muhammad the wasila and fadila, this specific rank that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him. Wa-darajat al-aliyat al-rafi'ah and an exalted and lofty rank. And grant him the praiseworthy station that you have promised him. You do not, you always fulfill your promise. And this is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, who hears the Adhan and responds and says this dua, I will intercede for them. So one of the ways that we seek the intercession of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is by responding to the adhan and also once it is uh, completed to uh, supplicate with this dua. Qala uh, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. So this is not a, a hadith but it's related to something that uh, was passed down in tradition. He said, Man salla bi ardin fala. Whoever prays in kind of a barren or uninhabited area. And when a person is traveling or out in the woods or in the middle of nowhere or camping or something of that nature, and they pray, even if they're alone, there will be an angel praying to his right and to the left. So then the, 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 the statement continues, فَإِنْ أَذَّنَا وَأَقَامُ So if a person's alone and they just pray, there's two angels on either side praying with them. But if the person calls the adhan and then calls the iqama, صَلَّ وَرَاءَهُ أَمْثَالُ الْجِبَالِ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ There will be a, a, a multitude of angels like the mountains that will pray with that individual person. If they call the adhan an iqama. So this is once again an indication of the merit of the adhan. It's not something to be taken like, lightly. Now I remember uh, Habib Hussein al-Saqaf, uh, may Allah preserve him, who actually, you know, one of the beautiful memories in this masjid is actually being here with, with him. Inshallah, he comes back to America time and time again. Fi khayru afia. He was saying that uh, one of the indications of how quickly a person will traverse over the sirat on the day of resurrection, that they will go over the traverse over hellfire, is according to how quickly they respond to the adhan. And he said another indication is how quickly 
they reject evil insinuations and, and the insinuations of the nafs or wasawas is the speed with which they reject those things that are displeasing to Allah is another indication of the speed uh, of how quickly they traverse over the sirat. So when we hear the adhan, it's extremely important. We'll have questions, inshallah, at the end. Uh, so uh, this is one of the things that the adhan, and then it's also uh, preparing for the salah, that in order to have presence of heart and really be in a state where you are uh, internalizing the meanings and the states of the prayer, it's not something that just when the uh, uh, Imam says Allahu Akbar and you enter into the prayer, you're there. But it's actually this gradual process that begins with the Adhan, that begins with making wudu. And uh, as we mentioned yesterday at Lighthouse Masjid, that Sayyidina Ali Zayn al Abidin radiallahu anhu, when he would actually be making wudu, his color would change and he would be turn yellow. And they would say, what, what is, what's going on? You look different, you look pale, your color has changed. And he would say to them, after making wudu, he says, do you know before whom I am about to stand? So he would be present even in his wudu. So all of these things help facilitate our presence in the salah. Then Imam al-Ghazali takes us to the merit of the obligatory prayers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the noble Qur'an, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا That the prayer uh, is at prescribed times for the believers. And this is related to the obligatory prayers, because those are the prescribed times. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam teaching us the centrality after the shahada, after the testimony of faith, there is nothing greater than the salawat. It is one of the, it is central after the, the shahada, it is the central pillar that holds everything up in our deen. So he tells us salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi khamsu salawatin katabahunna allahu ala al-ibad that there are five prayers that Allah has made obligatory for the servants. فَمَنْ جَاءَ بِهِنَّ وَلَمْ يُضَيَّعْ مِنْهُنَّ شَيْئًا اسْتِخْفَافًا بِحَقِّهِنْ كَانَ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدٌ أَنْ يُدْخِلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ So whoever establishes them, the five prayers, and does not lose any of or does not uh, leave aside any of its rights out of thinking little of the prayer, then that person has an oath with Allah that he will enter him or her into paradise. If a person establishes the salah and does not, you know, oh, I'll pray it later, or does not think that they're unimportant, and they literally give their lives, and uh, uh, that they construct their lives around the salawat. That's what we have to do. It's not something that we fit into our day, but really that the salawat are the pillars of our day, and everything else is fit in around them. And that we establish them properly and that we give time to learning the reality and the inner states and meanings of the salah. This is, this is the purpose of our life. And whoever does that, the Prophet wasallam says that they have an oath with Allah that he will enter them into paradise. In other words, it's a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith continues. So that's the case of the one who establishes them properly. And whoever does not pray these five prayers, he has no oath with Allah. He has no covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah wills, he will punish that person. And if Allah wills, he can enter them into paradise. This is an indication that they're Muslim, but we don't even want to be in the situation of, of danger. We don't even want to risk it. And as Imam al-Ghazali is going to teach us, inshallah ta'ala, not only do we not want to risk it, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he said, وَجُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَاةِ The most beloved thing that Allah gave me and placed in my heart in the life of this world is the salah. So that's an indication of 
all of the various degrees of nearness and the gifts and the blessings and the mercy and the openings that a person can receive through the salah. And this is something the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he established and you see that it saturated the souls of the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhu. You know, one of the things I always think about is that they didn't have alarm clocks. So it's like, how do you get up for, you know, not for them, it wasn't even Fajr. Fajr wasn't even an issue. It was like Qiyam al You know, they were getting up in the, the middle of the night on a regular basis and they were praying. And it's something that was instilled in their hearts of the reality of the Salah. Now that is the Sahaba, but when we seek this type of knowledge and whoever is sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and puts forth an effort, uh, those same treasures are open to us as well. That's why even to this day you find people, the, the greatest thing in their life is the Salah. And as Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, or uh, it might even be attributed to others, that if the, the people of the world, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu said, one of the, the, the reasons that I, one of the only reasons that I love to remain in this world is, uh, uh, and one of the reasons that he mentioned was the night prayer, Qiyam al-Layl. And other Salihin, they said, if the kings of the world, the people who love luxury and they vie with one another and compete with one another about the things of the dunya, and they want to have all of these different experiences and uh, enjoy the, 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 they think that their joy, they're trying to acquire as much of it as they can in the life of this world. If they knew the joy that we experienced in Qiyam al-Layl, they would try to take our lives in order to steal it from us, if they could, but they can't. You know, this has a very special door that you have to go through. And that door is ubudiyah, servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognizing that this is far better than, you know, very superficial and fleeting worldly things. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the ahadith continue. This is one of my uh, favorite and it's, it's, often, uh, it's often referred to with regards to the salawat that he said sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, مثل الصلوات الخمس كمثل نهر عذب غمر بباب أحدكم يقتحم فيه كل يوم خمس مرات. The likeness of the prayer, if you really want to understand the salah and what it does and some of the spiritual benefits within the salah, it is like a sweet and uh, deep uh, a river or stream that flows right at the door of one of your houses. Imagine right before you walk out of your house and there's this beautiful, clear, sweet, cool stream that uh, is right in front of your house. And that, that person, he then swims or immerses himself in that river or that stream five times every day. فَمَا تَرَوْنَ ذَلِكَ يُبْقِي مَنْ دَرَنِهِ would you then see that that person has any, uh, uh, any filth or anything that's unclean that remains on him? If he's swimming in this river, this very you know, life-giving and vibrant and beautiful river, and he swims in it and immerses himself in it five times a day, would that person have any dirt? And obviously the answer is no. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he said, فَإِنَّ الصَّلَوَاتِ الْخَمْسِ تُذْهِبُ الذُّنُوبَ كَمَا يُذْهِبُ الْمَاءُ الدَّرَنِ He says the five prayers, they remove sins the way that that water removes uh, filth and things that are unclean. But once again, this goes back to why we're studying this book and the importance of understanding this deen in the fullest sense and really seeking sacred knowledge that is uh, comprehensive of the outer and inner dimensions of these acts of ibadah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Qur'an, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَعَنَ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ That the salah prevents one from vile and evil deeds and wrongdoing. So someone might say, I know someone who prays regularly and so forth, but why is it that uh, they, they are not refraining from wrongdoing and from vile actions. And, and oftentimes, you know, especially young people, they'll notice that, that there might be something that's not fully aligned. 
that a person's actions and a person's state do not really seem to be indicating the same thing. And the ulama of the inner science of the heart, they say that that's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is referring to the reality of the salah. It's not just standing up and going through the motions, but the reality of the salah is meant to be transformative. That if someone enters into the presence of the King of Kings, subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone's heart is before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are knocking at his door and they are witnessing him as one is meant to. The salah is transformative. It's a, it's a powerful experience. So it's not something that uh, is just meant to be outward. And there were people even in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said that they, from these people you'll see in the future that you will find people who their salah will make you embarrassed about the state of your own prayer, their outward salah. Their siyam will make you feel like you're falling short in your own siyam. But it's a, a merely an outward reality because those people then start just like Iblis. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. They start to think that they're better than others. They start to think that they're better than others. Look at my salah, look at my siyam. But it's just an outward form. If you had the reality of the salah, you would, it would humble you. You would not look down on others. You would realize and begin to witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings upon you and His mercy, and you would desire good for others. So it's not the outward form, once again, it's a balance. It is both. It is both. That the sharia, I remember hearing this from, from Shaykh Yahya, I wrote it down, that the sharia is like the outer shell. And in order to get to the pearl inside, you have to have the sharia. You have to have the outward dimension of this deen, but then the spiritual reality is the pearl inside. So you need the shell to protect the pearl. But we also, we, we want to get to the pearl. We want the, the, the fruit, the essence of, uh, uh, of that act of ibadah, of that act of ibadah. Now, so here the Prophet is saying that these prayers, they remove sins, just like if a person immerses himself in this river, this flowing river, and that they will be uh, cleansed of all dirt and impurities. And this is also uh, further, uh, further emphasized or supported by another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also narrated by Imam Muslim. إِنَّ الصَّلَوَاتِ الْخَمْسِ كَفَّارَاتٌ لِمَا بَيْنَهُنْ مَجْتُنِبَةِ الْكَبَائِرِ That the five daily prayers are expiations. They expiate, they remove the sins that occur in between them as long as a person avoids major sins. So this is an indication that this refers to the minor sins, right? That the salawat, uh, uh, they remove and they cleanse us of those sins. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he also said, بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ الْمُنَافِقِينَ شُهُودُ الْعَتَمَةِ وَالصُّبْحِ لَا, يستطيع لا يَسْتَطِيعُونَهُمَا He said the difference between us and hypocrites. Once again, it's really interesting and it's undeniable how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made the prayer in congregation and praying on time the, the indication of the soundness of a person's iman. And the lack of that in, in an indication of hypocrisy. So he says وسلم, that the difference between us and the hypocrites is uh, being present for the isha and subah prayer. So atama is isha and subah is also referred to oftentimes as fajr. And that those two prayers especially uh, the, that the hypocrites are not able to pray them. So if we have a deficiency, and especially those two prayers, we have to make an effort to rectify that. And the Prophet ﷺ also said it in another hadith, that أثقل الصلاة على المنافقين صلاة العشاء وصلاة الفجر That the, most, the heaviest, the weightiest that weighs them down Prayers uh, uh, for the hypocrites is Salatul Isha 
and Salatul Fajr. And then what did he say? So he said, وَلَوْ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا فِيهِمَا لَآتَوْهُمَا وَلَوْ حَبْوَهُ If they knew what Allah gives in those two prayers, they would come to them even if they had to crawl. Imagine someone can't even walk and all they can do is crawl. If they knew what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives in those prayers, if they had to crawl from their home to attend, they would do so. Of the, the mercy and the blessings and the gifts and the veils that are removed from the hearts. And many of the great Salihin, we're going to get to the Masajid shortly, but it's all interconnected. They said that uh, just they, they received certain uh, openings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a presence of heart, a greater degree of witnessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His attributes and His blessings, kind of, uh, you know, uh, attaining higher levels of certitude. They said, we attained certain gifts from Allah related to that in the masajid, that even if we were somewhere else and we strived very hard in ibadah, we wouldn't have received the same portion that we got in the masjid. Because there's something about the mercy that a person receives, you know, particularly in those places that are dedicated to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or gatherings where people come together collectively to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Imam al-Ghazali is now warning us of the danger of falling short. So he says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَنْ لَقِيَ اللَّهَ وَهُوَ مُضَيِّعٌ لِلصَّلَاةِ لَمْ يَعْبَ إِلَّهُ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ حَسَنَاتِهِ Whoever meets Allah and that person has lost the prayer, that they have not established it, that they have been totally neglectful of the prayer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares not for any of his other good deeds. A person meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they might have a lot of other good deeds, but if they have been neglectful of the salah, Allah cares not for those other hasanat. He also said, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, the prayer is the pillar of the religion, holds everything else up. Whoever leaves it or is neglectful of it has destroyed his religion. Everything else is going to fall apart. It's on a very, very weak foundation without the salah. One of the companions, he asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is the most beloved and meritorious action? Ayyul a'mali afdal. What is the best action that's most beloved to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? And he said, as-salatu li mawaqitiha. The prayers in their prescribed times. Praying on time. Some of the salihin, the way that they, and, and this might sound like an oversimplification, but actually it's really beautiful if you think about it. This really helps us prioritize what it's all about. Some of the Salihin, they said, our lives consist of praying the five prayers and waiting to die and meet Allah. It shows us what it's really about. And everything else is secondary. Um, there are many other uh, hadith uh, about that. Uh, um, We'll end with this one and then we'll move on to the next point, inshaAllah ta'ala. وَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَنْ تَرَكَ صَلَاةً مُتَعَمِّدًا فَقَدْ بَرِئَ مِنْ ذِمَّةِ مُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وسلم. Whoever neglects the prayer on purpose, purposefully, intentionally, that person has absolved themselves from the protection of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and from his community. وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ So this shows us, this, it's really not something that we can uh, take lightly at all. But after the shahadatain, this is the most important thing that we have to establish. And we have to uh, uh, properly give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his due with what relates to this act of ibadah. The next uh, section is the merit of praying in jama'ah. And we touched on that a little bit. But here Imam al-Ghazali gives us some ahadith related to that. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Salatul jama'ati tafdulu salat al fadhi bi sab'in wa ishreena daraja. That praying in congregation 
is more is more superior to praying individually by 27 degrees which can be understood as 27 times better than praying alone so if a person prayed for example shall we pray salatul dhuhr together if a person prays in jama'ah salatul dhuhr and they went and prayed it by themselves 27 times then if they did it 27 times it might equal the salat in jama'ah so it shows that it is multiplied many, many times over and that it's not something that we want to miss out on or, you know, think lightly of, oh, no, I'll just pray by myself. You know, and even in our homes as families, it should be a culture that we uh, cultivate in our homes that we pray together as a family. You know, that we, we have these times and these uh, points where we come together and then praying together in the masjid, you know, uh, especially for men, is something that is uh, even an even greater emphasis, an even greater reward. There are many ahadith related to that. Yeah. One of the ahadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man shahid al-isha fa qama nisf al Whoever is present for the isha prayer in congregation, it is as if that person has prayed half of the night. That's a beautiful gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That a person has prayed half the night. And then, if the person shahida uh, subha So, and then whoever follows that up with praying salatul fajr or salatul subh in congregation, that makes up the second half of the night, and it's as if the person has prayed the entire night. So a person can come, pray Salatul Isha, go home and sleep all night, and get up for Salatul Fajr, and pray Salatul Fajr in Jama'ah, and it's as if they prayed the entire night. It's that uh, meritorious and important. Now, there are many other ahadith related to that, but even the ones that we covered before in the previous section related to the state of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, uh, that's something that is uh, significant enough to inform us of the weightiness of Salatul Isha and Salatul Fajr, but also praying in Jama'ah. And that the more we strive to pray in congregation and we commit ourselves to that and, and uh, uh, really are determined, the, the further away from hypocrisy we are, inshallah ta'ala. And the more it's a testimony to the soundness and the trueness of a person's iman. The last section that we'll look at is Fadila to Sujood, the merit of Sujood. And this is a really beautiful section, and there are many ahadith about this particular position in the salah. So we looked at the adhan, we looked at the obligatory prayers, we looked at praying in jama'ah, and then it's as if Imam al Ghazali is taking us deeper and deeper and highlighting the most important aspects of the salah, and within the salah, there is something very distinct and unique about sujood. And it also is the position that is the greatest representation of ubudiyah, complete servitude, and humbling oneself entirely before one's Lord and Creator. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَا تَقَرَّبَ الْعَبْدُ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ بِشَيْءٍ أَفْضَلَ مِنْ سُجُودٍ خَفِي that a servant draws closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah mighty and majestic, with nothing more meritorious. In other words, there's nothing better in drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a sujood, a prostration that is hidden. That's in private. That you just maybe at home, you have a particular area where you pray, maybe in your room, or maybe in your, if you have a musalla at home, or a room that's dedicated for prayer, or even a small area that you dedicate for prayer, and no one else is around, and you engage in salah, and you go into sujood, nobody else sees you. That is the thing that brings you closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as Imam al-Junaid, one of the greatest Imams in Islamic history, the, the, the Sayyidul al-Ta'ifah, the Imam of especially in, in preserving 
the sciences of uh, Islamic spirituality and tasawwuf. Imam al Junaid, after he passed away, someone saw him in a dream and they say, What has Allah given you? What have you received? What did you find after passing from this world and entering into the barzakh? And he said, All of the various terminologies and different sort of uh, things that people kind of might compete with each other about or think that is so important and so significant. He said, all of that kind of dissipated. And what I found that benefited me the most is two rak'ahs that I would pray in the middle of the night. That's what I found with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one of the greatest imams. It doesn't mean that those other things aren't important, but it goes to show if that's really what he's highlighting, what he found with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it's, it's very valuable and weighty. The Prophet ﷺ was once asked, and this is another one of these really uh, kind of uh, central and foundational ahadith, that one of the Sahaba, Sayyidina uh, Ka'b, uh, Sayyidina Rabi'a ibn Ka'b al-Aslami, radiyallahu anhu, he was serving the Prophet ﷺ and he brought him his wudu water. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked him, he said, Sal. he gave him the option, he said, ask for whatever you want. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, I ask you for your companionship, for your murafaqa, to be in your company in paradise. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, do you have any other request? Sometimes the lover is tested. Any, anything else? And then he was, mashallah, he said, who was that? That's it. That's everything. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave him the, the, the way, the formula, in order to be granted that. He said, sujood. Assist me with your nafs and assist me over your nafs or in order to do that, with what? With abundant sujood. Through abundant sujood, it becomes more accessible uh, to be in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in paradise. So if that was the only hadith about sujood, it would be enough. That that's the way to be with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in paradise. Yeah. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said, Inna aqraba ma yakunu l'abdu min Allahi ta'ala an yakuna sajidan. This is a hadith narrated by Imam Muslim. The closest a servant is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when he is prostrating or when she is prostrating. That is the closest that a person is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember what Imam al-Ghazali said at the beginning of the book that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his gentleness and in his mercy, he has made himself accessible in a way that the kings of this world can never, never make themselves accessible to people. And that through his gentleness and mercy, he has opened that door and removed the veil so that people can be close to him and seek from him at any time. And uh, uh, this is also the meaning of the verse of the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْجُدْ وَاقْتَرِبْ And make sujood and draw close. That that is the closest you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah describes the Sahaba in the Quran and He describes the nur, the light that emanates from their faces and He ties it subhanahu wa ta'ala to the sujood. So he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said anything that they're, the light that emanates from their face is from their dhikr. The light that emanates from their face is from their siyam. The light that emanates from their faces from all of the various acts of ibadah definitely illuminate one's heart. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, As-sujood. Simahum fi wujuhihim min athar sujood That their traits, the radiance can be witnessed and they can be recognized from the effect, from the impact of their sujood. That that nur emanates from them from the impact uh, of the sujood. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam, his great-grandson, his great-grandson, the son of Imam al Hussein Radiallahu Anhu Wa Arda, Sayyidina Ali Zayn Al-Abidin Ibn al Hussein, that he would, uh, that he would make sujood a thousand times a day. 
that he would pray so abundantly that he would perform a thousand sujood a day, which is why he's known as Zayn al-Abideen, the ornament, the beauty of the worshippers, because he because of his sujood. And he's the, the great grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, and they are the greatest uh, exemplars and inheritors of the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And then there are many stories that Imam al-Ghazali then mentions of the Salihin, and we'll end with a few of them. That كان يوسف ابن أسباط يقول that Yusuf ibn Asbat he would say to uh, some of the, the young people, he would say, يا معشر الشباب Oh, young people, بَادِرُوا بِالصِّحَّةِ قَبْلَ الْمَرَضِ فَمَا بَقِيَ أَحَدٌ أَحْسُدُهُ إِلَّا رَجُلٌ يُتِمُّ رُكُوعَهُ وَسُجُودَهُ He says, you know, take advantage of your health before your sickness. Because there is no one on the face of the earth that I envy, and this is not a haram envy. Right? This is غبط, right? غبطة. That I envy in this way that what the opportunity that they have, that I wish that I had, except a person who is able to perform the ruku' and sujood completely and perfectly. That one of the ways that you show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the, the health and the ability to do so is actually using that uh, health and that ability in ibadah, in the ruku' and in the sujood. There might be some people for a health reason or if they get elderly, that becomes more difficult. So he would say to young people, take advantage, because the sweetness of sujood is the only thing that I envy anyone in this world over, that they're able to do that. وَقَالَ عُقْبَةُ بْنُ مُسْلِمْ Another one of the pious predecessors. He said, مَا مِنْ خَصْلَةٍ فِي الْعَبْدِ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ رَجُلٍ يُحِبُّ لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ that the most beloved trait or characteristic that a servant has that is the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that that person loves to meet Allah. That is the most beloved thing. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he seals our lives, that when we leave this world, that he seals it with a husnul khatima, a good end, and that he gives us at that moment the greatest love and yearning to meet him, Ya Arham al -Rahimin. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet them. So this is what he's referring to. So that's the first part. وَمَا مِن سَاعَةٍ الْعَبْدُ فِيهَا أَقْرَبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْهُ حَيْثُ يَخُرُّ سَاجِدًا That the, the moment, the time, the trait that's most beloved to Allah is loving to meet him. And the time that the person is closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when they prostrate into sujood. And then finally, that the closest a person is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when they are in sujood. So abundantly supplicate when you are in sujood. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are in sujood to fulfill your needs and to give you what you are seeking because that is the moment that you are closest to him subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah we'll finish here wa sallallahu ta'ala ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen maybe we'll just take five minutes for questions and then we'll take a brief break uh, and transition to session two inshallah ta'ala yes Ah, mashallah, that's a very good question. So if you're praying at home, it is always better to call the adhan yourself. And even though, you know, a recording or YouTube, that's very nice. Uh, according to what I understand from my teachers, that's not an actual replacement for the adhan. So to actually call the adhan oneself is better. Even if you're at home, even if you're alone. Yes. And then we'll see the sisters. Yeah, please. Yeah, mashallah, that's a very good question. So uh, in the salah, 
there are some slight uh, differences of opinion among the ulama. Uh, some ulama really emphasize that in the sujood, you only say the duas from the Quran and the sunnah, or that that's most highly emphasized. Uh, another thing is that because we're in the salah uh, and uh, the supplications and the, that we should make those duas in Arabic. So generally when we're in the salah, we should stick to the duas from the Quran and from the sunnah and the duas that we memorize that are in Arabic, and then outside of the salah, and we're making general dua, that can be in any language and so forth. But to preserve the validity of the salah, uh, that, that, that is a, the, the better approach, just to keep it from the Quran and from the sunnah, what one knows in Arabic. Sheikh, yeah, that's also the case for Nafil prayers as well. Uh, about dua in Arabic, in sujood. No. Yeah, for, that's, that's the case for... You can make it in another language in your heart, but whatever you verbally say in the salah, it should be in Arabic. Yes. Mm. Mashallah. Mm. Mashallah. Mashallah. Beautiful. Two very good questions. So, salatul lima wa qitiha. That hadith indicates the prescribed times. There's another hadith that talks about the merit of praying in the earlier time over the end of the prescribed time. So there's obviously a window, uh, but the, that praying at the beginning of the time is superior to praying at the end of the time. So generally speaking, in addition to praying in those times, that there is an added fadl, an added merit of bringing the salah uh, and praying it in the earlier times. So then his second question was, uh, you know, praying in jama'ah, should I pray at home with my wife, for example, if there's no one else for her to pray with, or should I pray in jama'ah at the masjid? I actually thought about that for a while, and then I heard uh, one of our teachers say something beautiful. He said that many of the salihin, out of their concern and their, uh, their commitment to praying in jama'ah in the masjid, is that they would pray at home with their families and then pray in jama'ah at the masjid as well. So that's a way where you can uh, you know, also pray in jama'ah with, with your, your wife and your family. And then in addition to that, the higher road is also to pray in jama'ah at the masjid, to repeat it with, with the jama'ah uh, uh, in the masjid. So uh, the, I thought that was yani, the most comprehensive answer that, that I came across and wanted to share it with you. Anything from the sisters? We'll take one question. Yes. No. No. Ma yeah. Yeah, mashallah. Uh, so sisters calling the adhan, uh, uh, that's, that, that's not the case for sisters, so thank you for asking that. It's, it's, for, it's encouraged for men to do so. Um, and then for sisters praying in congregation, I know that among the, the great imams of the madahib, there are differences of opinion regarding, you know, if a sister can lead other sisters in jama'ah. Uh, and I would just tell people, encourage them to study according to uh, one of the, the four schools and follow uh, whatever, you know, their, that, that school, the position of that school. And there's flexibility with regards to that. Ah, mashallah. Mashallah. Naam. So, so once again, so this is something where a person has to uh, try to uh, really do the best that they can according with their particular circumstances and their own kind of state. So the question is, you know, if it applies to sisters to also pray in congregation and at the masjid and so forth, the Prophet ﷺ didn't prevent that. Uh, but he also encouraged and said that it's better for women to pray at home if they so wish. So it is better, but if they would like to pray, let's say for example, sometimes I have no one at home I'm feeling when I'm in the masjid, I'm with the community, that really helps me stay motivated. And if I'm at home, maybe I'm going to be affected by laziness or other things. 
So then a person can really choose based on their own circumstances. Um, but we recognize that the Messenger of Allah said, said, it's better to pray at home, but there were Sahabiyat who prayed in the masjid. So there's room, there's flexibility there. Jazakumullahu khayran wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.